Pokemon is a game series that holds a surprising amount of replay value. While the game intends for you to simply play it once and then do post-game content like Battle Towers and completing the Pokedex, there are many who instead replay these games with self-imposed limitations, such as Nuzlocke runs, monotype teams, or attempting the Professor Oak challenge. Some people instead choose to shiny hunt, doing thousands of resets for the target they want, and in some cases there are people who combine both. While there are often many different ways of getting a shiny, some will decide to attempt the hunt with a specific method instead of going for what would be easiest, either because there's some tangible benefit for obtaining a Pokemon in that method, like a ribbon or a special Pokeball, or simply because they want the bragging rights of getting a very difficult or rare target. And in my opinion, there is one method of hunting that is arguably the most punishing of all, as not only do you compete with the usual random chance of finding a shiny, but that shiny also has a chance of simply running away before you can even catch it. Welcome to Safari Week, a community shiny hunting event where the only rule is you have to hunt in the Safari Zone. And in this video, I'll be going over some of the complex mechanics for the Safari Zone and how to best prepare for this year's Safari Week. First introduced in red and blue, the Safari Zone operates on an entirely different catching mechanic than the rest of the game. Instead of battling wild Pokemon to weaken them before catching, you instead have to go into the wild entirely on your own. Wild Pokemon here won't attack you, but instead they have a chance of simply running away at the end of every turn and ending the encounter. You also don't have the option of using your own Pokeballs either, meaning you can't just launch a Master Ball if you see a Shiny. Instead, you are given 30 Safari Balls as part of your entrance fee, which have the same catch rate as a Great Ball. This makes catching Pokemon a lot harder than normal, as you can't use moves like False Swipe, Mean Look, or Hypnosis to increase your chances, and the odds of catching a full health Pokemon in a Great Ball are less than great, especially on rarer Pokemon like Chansey. But the Safari Zone is also the only place where Tauros, Kangaskhan, and Rhyhorn can be found in both Generation 1 and their GBA remakes, so venturing here is mandatory in order to complete the Pokedex. You do get a couple of tools for improving your chances though. Food and rocks. Throwing bait will reduce the chance of them fleeing, but also reduce the chance of capturing, whereas throwing rocks has the opposite effect, making them much more likely to run, but also more likely to stay in the ball. The Safari Zone was closed in gold, silver, and crystal, but a new Safari Zone was added in heart gold and soul silver, as well as there being a Safari Zone in Hoenn, and an equivalent area in Sinnoh called the Great Marsh. The Hoenn Safari Zone also appears in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, but it doesn't use the Safari mechanics, and wild Pokemon here are battled normally. Each of these Safari Zones have their own unique quirks, encounters, and mechanics, each of which I'll be going over in their own segments, as well as covering some general tips and tools that can help you understand and increase the odds of finding and catching your preferred target. While shiny Pokemon didn't technically exist in Generation 1, you can still shiny hunt here, although you'll only be able to do it by fishing. In Generation 2, shiny Pokemon are determined by the internal stats of the Pokemon, and due to how wild encounters are generated, only gifted Pokemon and fishing encounters in Generation 1 have a chance to be shiny when moved into a later generation. Fortunately, you can fish in the Safari Zone, so it's possible to encounter aquatic Pokemon like Magikarp, Krabby, Slowpoke, and even Dratini. But since you can't check a Pokemon's stats until you catch it, you'll simply have to catch every Pokemon you find and either check their stats manually or transfer them into Generation 2 or Pokemon Bank in order to see if you caught a shiny. If you're playing on original hardware, you could also connect to Pokemon Stadium 2 and play the game at a faster speed, while also being able to check shinies by looking at your boxes in the lab. As for catching, the best strategy in Generation 1 is simply just throwing Safari Balls at everything you see. Using rocks to double your catch rate does sound like a good idea when faced with hard-to-catch Pokemon like Dragonair, but throwing a rock or a bait uses up your turn, and after that the Pokemon gets a chance to react, and an angry Dragonair has a more than 50% chance of simply running away. Meanwhile, throwing bait will make it four times less likely to run, but also much less likely to capture, and if you run out of your 30 Safari Balls, the Safari game is over and you can't continue the battle. For this reason, it's a good idea to always have the maximum amount of Safari Balls at all times, as Pokemon with a low chance of running can still escape if you don't have enough balls to catch them. There's a Gen 1 Safari Zone Catch Rate Calculator on Cave of Dragonflies that will tell you the best method for the Pokemon you're encountering, although in almost all cases the best answer is just throwing Safari Balls. And if you want to calculate for Shinies without trading or transferring them, there's a handy Gen 1 Shiny Calculator on Blue Moon Falls, both of which I'll link in the description. All of the fishing targets, as well as all the other Safari Zone Pokemon, can also be hunted in Fire Red and Leaf Green. This updated version of the Safari Zone uses a slightly different calculation for whether Pokemon stay or flee, and bait is now a much more viable strategy for ensuring a catch. Each Pokemon has a catch factor which is equivalent to its usual catch rate divided by 12.75, ranging from 20 to 2. Each rock throw will double the catch factor and each bait will halve it. Meanwhile, an angry Pokemon has double the chance of escape, 
and a Pokemon that is eating has a quarter of a chance, which doesn't increase with additional rocks or bait. These catch modifiers do have a limit. Using rocks can't increase the catch factor above 20, so throwing rocks at Magikarp and Poliwag, which already have a catch factor of 20, will have no effect other than increasing the chance of them running away. The most interesting part, however, is that using bait cannot reduce the catch factor lower than 3. Kangaskhan, Cypher, Pinsir, Tauros, Dratini, and Dragonair already have a base catch factor of 3, meaning that using bait will not make them any harder to catch, but will still reduce the chance of escaping, which in the case of these Pokemon is normally between 35 and 45% per turn. And in the case of Chansey, which normally has a catch factor of 2, using bait actually increases the chance of catching one. As using bait cannot reduce the catch factor lower than 3, the game will adjust the catch factor back to 3 if bait ever causes it to fall below that value and since using bait on Chansey would reduce its catch factor to 1, it then gets automatically increased to 3, despite that being higher than Chansey's usual catch rate. My friend Professor Rex has done a lot of work researching the effectiveness of bait and how to maximise your chance of catching Pokemon in the Safari Zone, and has made a very comprehensive lookup table for all of the encounters in this Safari Zone, and what combination of bait and balls gives you the best chance of catching your target. With all of this taken into account, your best chance of catching a Chansey in the Safari Zone is a massive 19%. And that's not your chance of catching it per ball, that's your chance of catching it with all 30 Safari Balls. Even if you do everything right, there's still an 81% chance the chance you will either run away or you run out of Safari Balls before it stays in. Add on top of that the 4% chance of finding a Chansey in the first place, and the 1 in 8192 odds of it being a shiny, and you can see why hunting in the Safari Zone is considered a challenge. There are still plenty of other Pokemon to find in the various Safari Zones, many of which are much easier to catch but you're in for a very long haul if you set your sights on one of the rarer spawns, as many of them are just as difficult to capture. Using the best available methods, it would take you an average of 472,000 encounters to find and catch a shiny pincer or cypher, and over 800,000 to catch a shiny chancy. Meanwhile, Dragonair's 1% encounter rate means it would take over 4 million encounters on average to catch a shiny using the most optimal method, and to my knowledge, this shiny has actually never been caught before, making it the true white whale of the Kanto Safari Zone, and even just seeing one is an achievement worth celebrating. Moving into Hoenn, there are actually two separate versions of this Safari Zone. While mostly identical, the Emerald Safari Zone includes two additional areas that open up after you beat the Elite Four, containing several Pokemon from the Johto region like Miltank, Houndour, and Mareep that were otherwise unobtainable in Generation 3, except through the Colosseum games or in-person distributions. In this Safari Zone, you have two different options for engaging with Pokemon. Throwing rocks has been replaced with going nearer, which will increase the catch and escape factor by 4. Moving closer additional times will increase the escape factor further, but the increase to catch chance will be reduced by 1 each time, giving you diminishing returns on your chance of catching versus the chance of the Pokemon escaping. To reduce the chance of escaping, you now throw your own Pokeblocks instead of having an unlimited supply of bait. Throwing Pokeblocks also has no effect on the catch factor, but its effect on reducing the escape factor is based on the nature of the target. A Pokemon's nature will affect the flavours it likes and dislikes, and a Pokeblock of its preferred flavour will reduce the escape factor more. Calculating the chance of your target fleeing is also much simpler in the Hoenn Safari Zone, as all Pokemon share an identical chance of escape. Every encounter starts with an escape factor of 3, and the chance of fleeing translates very simply into increments of 5%. An escape factor of 3 means every Pokemon has a 15% chance of fleeing each turn, and each time you go nearer will increase that chance by 20%. And while making Pokeblocks is a hassle, they are actually incredibly worthwhile, and can even ensure that a Pokemon never attempts to run from the battle. Logically, the escape factor is never meant to be lower than 1. Just like using bait in the Safari Zone in Fire Red and Leaf Green, this would translate to a minimum 5% chance of a Pokemon fleeing on every turn. But just like how bait interacts with Chansey, this mechanic isn't implemented correctly. Instead of the escape factor being a minimum of 1, the game will adjust the value to 1 if it falls below 0 and once the escape factor is set to 1, it can no longer be reduced any further by Pokeblocks. However, this adjustment only happens if the escape factor falls below 0, meaning that if you can reduce the factor to exactly 0, it won't be corrected to 1, and now the target has a 0% chance of fleeing for the rest of the battle, so long as you don't do anything else to modify the escape factor. Since the escape factor starts at 3 for all Pokemon, we actually want to throw a Pokeblock of a neutral flavour, as that will reduce it exactly to 0, allowing you to throw all 30 of your Safari Balls to attempt catching it. With the lowest catch rate in the Hoenn Safari Zone being 8.09% for Dodrio, Pinsir, Apom, Wobbuffet, Heracross, Standler, and Miltank, that would give us a roughly 92% chance of catching them if you bring all 30 Safari Balls, and an over 98% chance to catch anything else. Although the actual odds are a little bit lower than this, because the escape factor is only modified at the end of each turn, after the Pokemon decides if it will run away. So even if you do successfully feed it a neutral Pokeblock, there is still a 15% chance for the Pokemon escaping on the first turn. 
Of course, in order to reliably feed a neutral Pokeblock to a Pokemon, you have to know what nature it is, otherwise you might accidentally feed a positive Pokeblock and lock its escape factor to 1. Alternatively, throwing a Pokeblock that it hates will be ignored, but each additional Pokeblock that you use in an encounter has a different modifier to the escape factor, meaning that if the first Pokeblock is ignored, you'll want to throw a Pokeblock with a preferred flavour on the second turn to set the escape factor to 0. Luckily for us, there is a way of influencing the nature of wild Pokemon in the Safari Zone. Placing Pokeblocks in the feeders scattered around in the grass will have an 80% chance of changing a Pokemon's nature to be one that prefers the flavour of that Pokeblock for the next 100 steps. So for example, using a spicy Pokeblock will cause Pokemon with attack increasing natures like Adamant and Brave to be more common, and a sweet Pokeblock will attract speed increasing natures like Timid and Hasty. Generation 3 has a reputation for bad randomization code, however, and the process used for generating these natures means some of them are much more likely to appear than others. Although this works in our favour, as it means we have a much higher chance of accurately feeding the right Pokeblocks to our target Pokemon, provided its nature has been influenced by the Pokeblock feeder. Once again, a lot of this information is from research done by Professor Rex, and thanks to him we know the most optimal Pokeblocks to use against wild Pokemon to have the best chance of preventing their escape. Before moving on to the next Safari Zone, I think it's worth mentioning that while Pokemon in your party can't be used in battle, the Pokemon you bring with you aren't entirely useless. If you want to increase the frequency of encounters, you can have a Pokemon with the ability Illuminate in the front of your party, which will double the chance of encountering a Pokemon. Starting in Pokemon Emerald, several other abilities were also given bonus effects outside of battle, most of which interact with the wild Pokemon you encounter. Arena Trap and No Guard will also double the chance of you encountering a wild Pokemon, while inversely the abilities White Smoke, Quick Feet, Stench and Infiltrator will half the chance. Sticky Hold and Suction Cups will also increase the chance of an encounter while fishing, and Static will increase the chance of encountering an Electric type if it's possible to find one in that area. Magnet Pull has the same effect for Steel types, although there aren't any that can be found in the Hoenn, Kanto or Sinnoh Safari areas. Lastly, a Pokemon with Synchronize will have a 50% chance of changing a wild Pokemon's nature to match its own. You can use this in conjunction with the Pokeblock feeders, as if the Pokeblock feeder fails to modify the nature of a wild Pokemon, Synchronize will still have a 50% chance of activating, giving you a roughly 91% chance of seeing a wild Pokemon with the right nature. I would recommend leading with Illuminate, No Guard or Arena Trap, as seeing encounters more frequently is the best way to increase your chance of finding a shiny during Safari Week. You could also use the White Flute, which will increase your encounter chance by an extra 50% when used. The White Flute can be made on Route 113 in Hoenn, or obtained as a gift at Valor Lakefront in Platinum. These two effects can be stacked to make encounters 2.25 times more likely. The level of your leading Pokémon can also greatly help you, thanks to the effect of Repels. Repel is a great tool for avoiding wild encounters when you don't want them, but the way it works is by blocking encounters with wild Pokemon that are of a lower level than the Pokemon at the front of your party. If you know the level range for the Pokemon in a certain area, you can use your lead Pokemon to only filter out lower level encounters than your target, and increase the chance of finding the one that you actually want. In Area 1 of the Kanto Safari Zone, Kangaskhan has only a 4% encounter rate. However, by having a level 25 Pokemon as your lead and using a Repel, you can filter out half of the available encounters by removing the 15% chance of Paris, the 25% chance of encountering Nidoran, and the roughly 10% chance of seeing an Execute below level 25. This effectively doubles the chance of encountering the remaining Pokemon, giving you an 8% chance of finding Kangaskhan. If you instead use a level 27 Pokemon, you can filter out 90% of the encounters, turning the 1% Pinsir or Scyther encounter into a 9% chance, which is actually better than if you use this trick in the area where their encounter is normally 4%, as Pinsir and Scyther appear at a lower level in that area, and will only appear 6% of the time when using Repel effectively. You can use Bulbapedia and Cerebi to find out the level ranges for all the wild Pokemon in each area, but there's also a tool that can be used to calculate the encounter rates using the Repel trick, which will also be linked in the description. Another limiting factor of the Safari Zone that I haven't mentioned yet is the Step Counter. Your time in the Safari Zone will end if you run out of balls, but it also ends after you take a certain number of steps. 500 in Hoenn and Sinnoh, and 600 in Fire Red and Leaf Green. This can be a hassle during a long hunt like Safari Week, as you'll have to navigate your way back to where you are hunting after being returned to the entrance. And while the admission fee for the Safari Zone is small, you could be at risk of running out of money if you need to keep repeatedly re-entering. This isn't a problem for fishing encounters, as you don't need to move to keep casting your rod, and you can also encounter wild Pokémon without moving by using Sweet Send, or carefully rotating in place. The easiest method to avoid walking is in Ruby, Sapphire and Emerald though, as by using the Acro Bike, holding down B and hopping in place will allow you to keep encountering Pokémon without moving, which also removes the need to keep refreshing the Pokéblock feeder or your active repel. Lastly, I would also recommend saving at the entrance of the Safari Zone and only saving if you find a shiny, just so you don't run the risk of losing all your money or repels and being unable to get back in. 
In Sinnoh, the Safari Zone is replaced by the Great Marsh, but the Great Marsh is effectively the Safari Zone in all but name, even returning to the bait and rock system used in Kanto. Although this time, beating Pokemon over the head with rocks has been phased out, in favour of the less violent option of throwing mud. The effect of these options is actually the opposite of what you might expect, though. Pokemon in the Great Marsh apparently love mud, and throwing it at them will decrease the chance of escaping, with a 90% chance of also decreasing the catch rate, whereas throwing food will instead increase the chance of catching them, but also might increase the chance of them running away. But since there are no weird calculation errors to exploit this time, your best option is to simply throw Safari Balls and ignore the mud and bait entirely. There is actually one error in regard to flea rate, but it only affects Whizcash, which doesn't have a flea rate coded into the game, meaning it will only run away 0.4% of the time. The main gimmick of the Great Marsh is that some Pokemon are not always available. The Great Marsh is split into six areas, and each area will have one of its encounters picked randomly from a small pool, with this selection having a 10% chance of being encountered and will change every day at midnight. While you could run around in the marsh to check all the available Pokemon, you can also use the binoculars on the upper floor of the entrance building, and for $100 you'll be shown a random selection of Pokemon that can be encountered at the marsh. If you want to re-roll these encounters, you can do so by adjusting your DS's clock to just before midnight, and then allowing it to roll over to the next day. Attempting this in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, however, won't work, as timer-based events will be frozen for 24 hours whenever the clock is changed. As well as having a graphical update, the Great Marsh in Platinum has slightly different level and encounter rates than the Marsh in Diamond and Pearl, as well as having a few exclusive Pokemon like Tropius and Kecleon, so make sure you're looking at the right information if you're trying to use the Repel trick or figure out the best place to look for a specific target. And while mostly identical to their Generation 4 counterpart, the Great Marsh in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl is going to be statistically the best Safari Zone for seeing a Shiny, as it is the only game with a Safari Zone released after Generation 6, where the base Shiny chance was doubled. Your Pokedex completion will also help you with catching a Shiny before it runs away, as the chance of getting a critical capture increases the more your dex is filled, and having more than 450 registered Pokemon will give you the best odds possible. The only target available in Diamond and Pearl that doesn't appear in the remakes is Arbok, as it only appears in the Great Marsh when Fire Red is plugged into the dual slot on the DS. Overall, the diversity of encounters in the Great Marsh isn't that amazing though. If you like water, poison and grass types, then it's perfect, but if you want a lot more variety and control over the Pokemon you can encounter, then this last Safari Zone might be just what you're looking for. In Heart Gold and Soul Silver, the Warden has opened up a brand new Safari Zone on the west coast of Johto that was not present in the original Generation 2 games. This Safari Zone operates on the same catching and fleeing mechanics as the Great Marsh, but the major difference is in how many Pokemon can be found here. While the physical size of this Safari Zone is very small, there are over 150 Pokemon that can be caught here, if you know how to find them. The gimmick of this Safari Zone is that you are given the freedom to rearrange its six areas as you see fit, as well as swap them out between 12 different environments, each of which contains its own unique variety of Pokemon. In order to fully unlock the Safari Zone's potential, you will have to wait a little while. When first arriving, you're tasked with catching a Geodude and showing it to the Warden. Three hours later, he'll call you with a second challenge, introducing you to the area customizer and showing you how to customize the Safari Zone by adding in a desert so you can catch a Sandshrew. After you beat the game and get the National Pokedex, the Warden will call you once again and introduce you to the next feature of the Safari Zone. You can now place decorations such as trees, flowers, and benches in each of the areas. To begin with, you're only given six items, but every three in-game hours you'll be given six more decorations to choose from, with 24 to be unlocked in total. Half of these decorations are purely decorative, but the other 12 have a direct, tangible benefit, and these decorations are the key to unlocking new and rare encounters. These 12 decorations can be split into groups of three. The shrubbery and flowers are plains decorations, the tree, stump, and branches are forest decorations, the rocks are peak decorations, and the puddle, fountain, and waterhole are waterside decorations. Each area has 10 to 11 Pokemon that will only appear after a certain amount of decorations of a certain type are placed inside that area. For example, Zigzagoon will appear in the savannah once 10 planes objects are placed there, and Luxio will appear with 24 planes objects. Adding more objects than necessary, or adding objects of a different type, won't stop an encounter from appearing, so by adding 24 planes objects, you'll be seeing both Luxio and Zigzagoon in the savannah, and you can also add 4 forest objects to see Houndour as well. If you want to see Shroomish, you need to have 35 forest objects and 12 planes objects, however this is easier said than done, because you can only place a maximum of 30 objects in each area. This is where the real waiting begins. Waiting three hours at a time to unlock all the decorations was merely the setup, as now you need to wait multiple days for each area to upgrade. After an area has been active in the Safari Zone for 10 days, the effect of planes items there will be doubled. Then after 20 days, the effect of forest items are doubled, meaning you can now encounter Shroomish with only six planes objects and 18 forest objects. The effect of peak items is upgraded after 30 days, and waterside after 40 days. 
Then the process repeats again, with plains items becoming three times as powerful after 50 days, then forest items after 60 days, and so on, with the effect of the next decoration type becoming more powerful every 10 to 20 days, before all decorations reach a multiplier of 7 after 250 days. These days cannot just be skipped by turning the clock forward either. It seems the upgrade process only advances on days where you actively play the game, instead of simply checking how many days it has been since each area was added into the Safari Zone. And while there are no Pokemon that require the full wait of 250 days to be encountered, you do need to wait almost 4 months before you can encounter everything in certain areas. Bronzong and Bagon both require the equivalent of 56 peak decorations and 35 forest decorations in their respective areas, which can only be done after a minimum of 110 days, and many of the rarer Pokemon require a minimum of 70 to 100 days to be unlocked. Of course, there is also an interesting workaround that allows you to skip the wait time by removing your DS battery and letting the clock overflow by 100 years, and I'll include a link to a great guide by Reali that taught me how to do this last year. With the right placement of decorations, the repel trick, and using various abilities, you can give yourself very good odds of encountering a variety of rare and interesting Pokemon, like Aaron, Gibble, Torkoal, and even Riolu, which can't be caught anywhere else in Generation 4. This Safari Zone also uses Bait and Mud, although the effects of these have now been switched back to their correct functions. But just like with the Great Marsh, throwing Safari Balls is the optimal strategy for catching, as the effects of Bait and Mud aren't statistically worthwhile, although there is an exception. While Dragonair is the White Whale of the Kanto Safari Zone, Beldum and Matang are the equivalent for Johto. Thanks to the use of repels, you can encounter Beldum 100% of the time in the forest, and Matang 50% of the time in the mountain, or 85% if you also use a Pokemon with Magnet Pull, meaning seeing a shiny is much easier than Dragonair's 1% encounter rate. But the real challenge is actually catching one of these two. Beldum, Matang, and Metagross have the lowest catch rate possible of any Pokemon. The chance of capturing one is on par with legendaries like Mewtwo and Calyrex, and they are the only non-legendary or mythical Pokemon to have a catch rate this difficult. For reference, a sleeping Beldum on one hit point has only a 4% chance of being caught in an Ultra Ball, and after 31 turns, a Timer Ball would only have a maximum catch rate of 9%. And in the Safari Zone, you have no modifiers like status conditions or low health to improve your odds with. You have to catch this Pokemon at full HP with what is functionally a Great Ball. In order to have a roughly 50% chance of catching it, you would have to throw over 150 Safari Balls. And don't forget that you only have 30. Not to mention the chance of Beldum escaping every turn, which is 35%. And while Magnet Pull will increase the chance of encountering Beldum, it won't stop it from running away. The odds of catching a Beldum are massively stacked against you. To be precise, the overall chance of failure is over 98%, as the odds of catching Beldum by throwing all your Safari Balls at it is only 1.16%. Attempting to catch Matang is slightly more forgiving, as its flea rate is only 24%, giving you a 1.7% chance of catching it before it runs away or you run out of balls. In this case, there is actually a method of improving your odds slightly, devised once again by our friend Professor Rex. While Bait has a chance to reduce the catch rate, the rate for Beldum and Matang is already as low as it can be, so by throwing 6 Bait in a row, you can minimise the flea rate and potentially maximise the amount of balls you can throw at it. After setting bait, the chance of Batang escaping each turn is now only 6.25%, and your chance of successfully capturing it has increased by 0.65%. In any other situation, that amount would be negligible, but if you want to actually catch a Matang, you'll want to take every statistical advantage that you can, even if it means taking the 57% chance of it running away during the baiting process. With a total catching chance of 2.37% per encounter, you would need to find over 40 shiny Matang to be at odds of actually catching one, and the shiny hunter Lucky Sparkles ended up doing exactly that, encountering more than 60 shiny Matang and 12 shiny Lunatones before finally catching one. Or you could be like me and just so happen to catch one first try, but hey, that's statistics for you. Oh my god! In the comments of my last shiny video, I saw a lot of people saying that the ease of finding shinies in recent generations, especially in generation 9, has taken some of the thrill and excitement out of actually finding one, and in some cases I can agree. There have been many times where I've stumbled on multiple full odd shinies in the same day while playing Pokemon Violet, and I've even reset over shinies when using Herba Mystica if they weren't my target, because I considered the herbs to be more valuable, and I know that it would be easy enough to find them again if I wanted. But the few shinies that I've seen during Safari Week were quite literally heart pounding. Hunting a shiny only for it to run away sounds masochistic, but it's also exciting. While I wouldn't really consider myself much of a hardcore shiny hunter, I found myself taking part in the last two safari weeks, and I'm planning to give it another go this year to hopefully reclaim the Riolu I lost last time, and I might even try for a Dratini or the Fabled Dragonair on the side. I also think this year's safari week might be quite important, as for all we know, it could be the final safari week before Bank shuts down, meaning this would be the last chance to transfer forward anything that you catch. But when exactly is safari week? Some might say it's a bit early for a Safari Week video, as it's usually held around the start of June, but that just so happens to be around 110 days away. 
which means if you're watching this video close to when I uploaded it, you should be able to set up your Johto Safari Zone just in time to hunt for anything you want in this year's Safari Week. Once again, I'd like to thank Professor Rex for help with verifying the information in this video, and all the resources I've mentioned will be in the description. That was brilliant, Candle, me. Very much enjoyed 